and welcome to Fall for the Books, Our Haunted Pasts. We're here today with Jan Beatty, Ari Honovar, and Soledad Caballero, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Okay, I'm Jan Beatty. Uh, this is my new book, American Bastard, um, coming out October 19th with Red Hen Press. I am Ari Honovar. My book is A Girl Called Rumi, came out on September 21st. And I'm Soledad Caballero, and my book, I Was a Bell, just came out September 7th from Redhead Press. Wonderful. So we're going to get started with a broad question, and then we'll get a little more specific, narrow it down. If you could each go through and tell us a little bit about your book and about what led you to start writing it. And we'll start with Jan. Okay, uh, thanks. American Bastard is a memoir that... Um, it sounds dramatic, but I've been working on all my life and never thought I could ever write it, uh, actively writing for the past 20 years, and again, thinking I could never write it. It's, it's uh, a book, a memoir focused on adoption. I was adopted uh, as an infant. Well, I was, I was born in an orphanage in Pittsburgh, a Rosalia Foundling Home in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. And uh, I, I was always looking for a book that told the truth about adoption and I could never find it. And uh, so I, I wrote one and that's really what it was about. And uh, it just took many, many years to, to get the courage and the skill and also to be brave enough to do it. And uh, I'm, I'm still kind of terrified about the whole thing, <laughs> really. Um, but yeah, here it is, it's here, so. And Ari? Yeah, so I was born in Shiraz, Iran, and part of the book is uh, takes place in uh, Shiraz, Iran, right around the, uh, the Iranian Revolution. And what happened was that when I was six, uh, the Iranian Revolution erupted and the Islamic Republic took over and cut women's rights in half and curtailed freedom of speech and expression. And those who opposed this tyranny were targeted, jailed, and executed. And then uh, months later, Saddam Hussein took advantage of this internal turmoil and attacked Iran uh, and started a war that lasted eight years and took countless lives. So this is um, the setting of, of the book is partly there and then partly in San Diego um, after the characters have migrated to America. Of what happened in Iran is that they, um, the government essentially banned music, dancing, and there was an actual war, there was an internal war, and then there was a war on joy, where we had a war on our coping mechanisms and uh, had to become really resourceful to um, not fall apart. And so, um, like my best friend was a boy and I couldn't play with him anymore because of the Islamic laws. And so we had to find um, tapping to join in really um, resourceful ways, in, in, in ingenious ways to survive. And uh, we relied on the power of storytelling and, and, uh, and poetry to, to, uh, to help us. And this is a story of that and a story of immigration and integration. And um... My book, I, I Was a Bell, uh, is uh, my debut poetry collection, and it, it deals with memory, I think, and, and the way that um, memory is sort of simultaneously what you remember in the present moment and kind of how you put it back together um, from, from that present moment to the past. And specifically, there are a couple of threads. Um, there's memories of, of living in Chile and then leaving Chile um, several years after um, Pinochet took over um, and being an immigrant in, in the United States. And then there are memories of, um, I'm a cancer survivor. So I think about kind of what the body remembers as well. And I guess it's a hard book. To, it was a hard book to write. Um, it, it took me a long time to write it, but I, I actually think it's also really, it's a book about joy and about how to love things that are hard how to remember things that are hard and still honor those things. That is the, the perfect lead in, Soledad, to my first uh, more specific question. 
um, which is the back and forth of both memory and place is a distinctive component of all three of your books. When writing, how did you think of and create the timeline or structure of your stories or series of poems? And did you think of that in a linear way or in terms of the emotional journey or some totally different way? Um, and I guess we'll just keep going in this order. Why don't we start with Jan? Okay. Um, yeah, memory and place. Uh, that was, I found that challenging because there was a lot of my childhood that I didn't remember. And so I didn't, I thought, well, how am I gonna write this memoir? Um, uh, so I, you know, I had had notes from many years and I just, you know, I just got all those uh, journals out and and I, I needed the foundation and as for the book and as, a, as an adoptee, I really didn't have a foundation for my life, um, not knowing my name until I was 32 years old. Uh, not knowing, you know, who I was, where I came from. So that uh, that foundation and that structure was really challenging. What I ended up doing was um, finding, I, I used, it, it might sound strange, but I used a topographical dictionary that I had um, and used place to ground me. Uh, I used, uh, it was a topographical dictionary of the West, which is a really another place that grounds me. So I used some definitions uh, of, uh, you know, natural occurrences in the West. For example, one of those was an infant stream, um, you know, in the book. So I would use some quotes or definitions to start sections and have like a metaphorical leap from that into whatever I was talking about. And even so, um, uh, the book is not written chronologically. And uh, I didn't want to write it chronologically. And although a lot of editors I showed it to wanted it to be chronological. <laughs> and I just couldn't, I didn't want it to be. And I, and I, I couldn't partially because of memory. Uh, I couldn't remember chronologically. So uh, finally, um, I found uh, Red Hen, um, who, who really supports the book. And I needed to find, I needed to find a woman to read the book and appreciate the book. I showed it to a lot of men, not um, male editors who love the book, but said, can you put this in order? Can you put this in order? And, and I said, no, and uh, <laughs> and I didn't realize that I had um, that all of the people I had referrals had had been uh, male editors, and uh, someone suggested, you know, show this to a woman, show this to a woman. So I I did, and that was the difference for this book. There was more of a looseness, I think, more of a a receptivity to um, that kind of structure to the book. So. Thank you. And when Ari, when you were thinking about that um, back and forth in memory and place, which is really a profound piece of your, of your book, um, how did you look at the timeline? Yeah, so I, uh, the book goes between um, 1981 and 2009, uh, and it's multiple points of view and uh, we learn what has become of the main character and her family after that one night that changes their lives forever. So, and the way that I structured it is just, yeah, it just very seamlessly goes back and forth between the uh, present and the past and, and uh, what weaves it together uh, is this uh, not present or the past, but this omnipresent yearning for liberation from suffering. And for that, the book weaves in the 12th century Persian mystic and poet Attar's Conference of the Birds, which is an allegory for spiritual attainment and how the nine-year-old Kimya, the main character, is drawn into this mythic tale and is able to tap into this mystical realm that sustains her and uh, through terrible circumstances. Uh, and then what happens when, when that story abruptly ends and we, you find yourself in this uh, 
uh, as, as an adult and uh, in, in America in a strange place. So I was also very curious about that internal journey uh, when we have our past being what it is and uh, uh, what happens when as an adult, we embark on the journey of coming home to ourselves and being at home with ourselves. Is it possible to welcome the past um, a past that includes both the magical perspective of a child, the gift or curse of our culture, and the unbearable suffering that we want to forget, and weave a new story that integrates all those threads. And Soledad, how about you? Um, yeah, so I, I'm just so uh, in tune with what my panelists are saying. Um, so, so place, right? So there's so many ways to think about place, right? And in some ways I would say memory is a place, right? Memory is a kind of country. Um, and I think for me, um, right, I have the location, when I started thinking about writing this book, right? Um, you know, you, you think of Chile and, and you think of Santiago and you think about kind of what was happening politically when I was there. Uh, but what I remember is, is love. Is, is family is is sort of warmth and and so uh, for me I think I started kind of thinking about the juxtaposition of sort of like how is a place that then you learn about as an adult and you read about and you research um, that that you know was horrific even in the moments that that you are remembering joy and love and 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 so that for me was really important um, in in thinking about so my my memories of Santiago or my memories of my family really are are kind of this um, this sort of place that feels very tender, uh, even as that is sort of surrounded right in, in in the poems around like the violence that sort of is structurally happening, um, and then you know then as a kid right we immigrated when I was seven. Um, I don't know if this is what's supposed to happen, but I kind of really connected with like the plain flat landscape of Oklahoma and and the snow and and there were no mountains right in in Santiago right the Andes are how people tell themselves where they are kind of now I'm a terrible person with direction anyway but um, but so I remember my mom kind of feeling like she was in an alien world because she's like, where are the mountains? So I know what direction I'm in, right? And for me, Oklahoma flatness, I feel free there, even though then as again, as an adult, you realize, oh my God, what's happened in Oklahoma in the, in the historical context of the United States was horrific, right? And, and sort of in the context of that. Um, and so then finally, then there's the space of language. Um, the space of Lord of being a child in in one way in one language and then being an adult in a, in a different language. And so for me, those are the threads that I was really thinking about. And honestly, a thread that kind of doesn't seem obvious in terms of memory and place was actually when I got sick and I had to think about the country of my own body as a place in order to sort of make sense of what was happening with my diagnosis. And so these are all the sort of um, ways that I think memory and place really are rooted for me in the book. It's it's so helpful. Um, so that it's like we your everything you say just leads right into the questions <laughs> I've been having for Excellent. all of you. It's perfect. As, um, and I'm here at moderating as both a reader and a writer myself. Right, so I have craft questions in addition to reader questions. So um, speaking directly to what you just said, truly, all three of your books are so different from each other in style and voice. And yet all three are so incredibly compelling and in the moment, um, even with that back and forth of what was and what is, even with the different geographical locations. Um, I think that um, that immersive storytelling, even with poetry and memoir, um, and that surprising mixture of lyrical language and urgent sensory experience is one of the things that makes all three of you are so distinctive. And I think it's something that many writers who are watching this would like to know more about in terms of the craft of how you wrote your books. Um, I know I would. So when you are writing about 
when you're creating characters or writing about real people or writing about different places, um, how do you make, you all three of you really made your books come alive in a very special way, I thought. Um, how do you do that? How do you write lyrically, which all three of you did, even even you, Jan, and, and it was, you know, a very different tone to it, but it was still. What do you mean, that, even me? <laughs> because yours is less lyrical, right? Yours is not going to be of this. I mean, when I'm reading ours, it's it's almost poetry in fiction form, and Soledad is poetry, and yours was a harder, um, more blunt voice, and yet still that use of language, I would still consider it lyrical in its own sense. So how do you, how did you three create that kind of vulnerability and authenticity and yet still use language so beautifully? I know this is a big ask, but as a writer, I am so intrigued by that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it is a big question. I, I wanna, I wanna um, as a way in, maybe reflect back on what Soledad said about, well, your use of the word tender, I thought was so good. And it really hit me as, you know, the tenderness of, you know, the stories that we're talking about. Tenderness as in, you know, close to the bone, but also tenderness as in warmth, tenderness as in coming from trauma. And I think all that, you know, coalesces, you know, in what we're talking about. And I think that's part of what, makes it possible for, of, of course, with the craft to, to make it lyrical. But um, as you said, um, the blunt voice, um, that was one thing that held me back from writing for a long time because, um, you know, there's a cultural story about adoption, which I consider to be a bunch of lies. And, uh, and a lot of adoptees feel the same way. And yet, there's so much pressure not to talk about it that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I was told, you know, be welcoming <laughs> from some friends who are writers, be welcoming with your audience, welcome them in, don't be too tough uh, uh, about adoption. And I tried that and I found it boring and not really real. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. And so, so I just, you know, went for as real as I could and, um, and then, you know, with, with the different sections, I had, like I said, I had all these notes from years and years and years. And when I finally got to the actual construction of the book, I had about 10 versions of the book. And, you know, of course, I just was transcribing a lot of these notes and just, you know, expanding, expanding, and then seeing what was there. And then really, it's just a lot of revision. And, and then, realizing well this is this is boring this is not developed this needs this needs to be a lot of compression for me to make it um have life and have um you know that lyrical sense because um it really my life is not that interesting i mean to write a memoir about it's not my life i mean it is my life but it's focused on adoption the whole book is about adoption uh for example um, my husband does not even appear in the book, which, you know, he shouldn't appear in the book, you know, it, it's, a, and I was trying to save him from, from all of this too, but, but there's, you know, it's only about adoption and uh, that's, that's the focus of it. So that I think allowed me to really, like you said, be immersive in my attention and also in my language. Okay, thank you. All right, how about you? Yeah, so I should preface um, my answer by saying that I was born in Shiraz, which is a city of poetry and wine. So mm -hmm. the you know I could recite Rumi and Hafez and Ferdowsi and Hayam and so many other poets and poets poetesses before I could read or write. So this is like in my blood. This this uh, poetry, like I tell a story of of going to our rooftops when we were brave to watch the anti-aircraft missiles shoot up in the air. And what we would see was, you know, to my seven-year-old eyes was this gorgeous pattern in the black sky that rivaled the best 4th of July fireworks. But underneath that, that um, awe, there was this, this 
terror brewing in my belly. Like who was the lottery of death going to claim next? Was it going to be me, my sister in Tehran, my best friend or my teacher? And then someone from another rooftop would shout something like, even if from the sky poison befalls all, I am still sweetness, wrapped in sweetness, wrapped in sweetness, wrapped in sweetness. And, you know, verses like that make an imprint on you as a child, or it, they go right into your heart and radiate to every cell of your being until your world is as glorious as a mystic poet. And in that moment, I mean, what bomb could ever touch that? So when I was writing, this is just so natural for me to just be in that, in that space. And then the characters, when they're whispering to me, they're also whispering their, their, their poems to me. Um, the, the least poetic one, um, all says um, his name is Arman and he's the brother who really renounces being Persian and he says sometimes in my weak moments I uh, slide back from my Persianness, from my Americanness to Persianness in this very awkward and jittery manner and and he feels very uncomfortable about that so even there is like even when he's completely rejecting the sense of poetry, he's still, it's part of him. So I don't, um, yeah, this is such a great question. Uh, and I'm just really thinking about what, what um, Ari and Dan have said. So, so I learned English when I moved to the States when I was seven. Um, and and then I became a, a professor of literature in English, right? So I think um, clearly I, I actually have a love affair with English. And, and I know, you know, as a, as a person who's multilingual, right, you're not supposed to talk about a language that is also hard to learn in that way. But I think I wanted to be as bombastic and as, as sort of subtle and as organic in English as I knew I could have been if I had stayed in Spanish, right? Um, and so for me, when I was thinking about the book, I really paid attention to every line, right? The line itself, the rhythm of the line, the musicality of the line um, mattered. And I, I wanted to have joy in the practice of being able to write in this language. Because when I, when I went to grad school and, and even in my early writing life, even in college, I always felt like I missed the boat, right? Like on writing English, right? Like, oh, I, I somehow didn't get the right amount of, of time or it didn't happen organically. And, um, and I think for me, this is a, it's lyrical and musical. And I think that has something to do, it must have something to do with how the lines form themselves into song in Spanish. But I think it's a book about loving English. I think it's a book about loving uh, a sort of the the sort of complexity uh, of English. Um, I, you know, I love in English. I, it's not that I don't love in Spanish, but it is something really true about about finding agency um, and joy in in a language that you had to learn. Right. Remember learning. Right. Like I was in ESL classes. Right. Um, but I think honestly, um, my mother was the first poet I met, even though I don't think she would ever call herself a poet, right? Um, and it's because um, she loves to have playfulness with words, with language. Um, I, like, like Ari, um, I remember reciting whole poems in Spanish as a kid. It was part of like a, a tradition, right? Um, and so I can't actually access those poems all the time, but I remember the sounds of them. And I think that, so I guess this is a long and convoluted way of saying, it's about the song of the language that I think um, was really important to me in, in thinking about the book in terms of craft. Poems are supposed to be said. Poems are supposed to be lived in the body, in the throat. You're supposed to feel them out of the mouth. And I, I, can, I think I want that for the book. Wonderful. You three are wonderful. <laughs> um, 
I'm okay. Be a professional here. I'm a <laughs> professional moderator. Um, um, speaking to that vulnerability that all three of you have have described, when you're writing about such vulnerable experiences, um, whether memoir, fiction, or poetry, is there a line that you draw in the sand about what or who you will or won't write about? Start with you, Jan. Um, well, I mean, I have um, I have six books of poetry that I've published before this. And, you know, there is the speaker that lives in the in books of poetry. The I is the speaker. It's not necessarily the poet. And that is a great protection, which I've come to really appreciate <laughs> after writing a book of nonfiction. You know, so yeah, so you can write, you know, I I could write anything in in poetry. And and you know, some of my poems are true, some of them aren't, some of them are mixed, some of them are total lies. But with this American bastard, now this is a whole different thing. And um, you know, oh, um, my my, I guess what I tell my students and what I believe is that in all writing, writing is not the place to settle scores. Writing is not the place to get back at anyone. Writing is not the place to deal with that emotion. Those emotions. Um, go to therapy and work on it or do whatever you have to do or talk to people. Uh, writing is the place to create the best book you can you can create and tell the story you need to tell. And so that's what I try to let guide me. You know, um, I, uh, you know, this book is just coming out. So I, um, I was very aware of that I was dealing with real people here and talking about my life and other people. Uh, I don't think I trashed anyone in this book. I didn't want to trash anyone. And yet there are some moments that are difficult for sure. Um, so, but the whole point of the book is to have something real about adoption. And so I needed to, to go into things. I don't know that there's any one line that exists, but except that line, like I'm not interested in hurting anyone or, you know, settling scores. And at the same time, I'm, I don't want to uh, make it pretty when it's not pretty, because that's what the culture does. And that's what the culture wants us to do. And that's really damaging, I think more damaging than making it real. And for an adoptee, um, we need something that's real. You know, if you're brought up without your name, without your history, without without your medical history, and then people are telling you they're your parents and they're not your parents, there's a great need for something authentic. And so a sense of the authentic was what I was looking for while trying to maintain a sense of honor and respect. So that was that was a huge challenge. And um, I can't, you know, I can't wait to get back to poetry because. <laughs> I don't see how nonfiction writers do this all the time. But it was uh, really, really challenging. But as is poetry, but yeah. How about you, Ari? I was so um, engrossed in Jen's description. I totally don't know what the <laughs> what the question is. <laughs> I will. I will repeat it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, and I, I will say that I'm an adoptee, so what Jan is saying very much rings true for me of this story of what it's like this not authentic um, story of so getting into what's vulnerable really um, speaks to me as as an adoptee outside of the literary world. Um, so the question was, um, when you write about vulnerable experiences, which you very much did, Ari, um, is there a line that you draw in the sand or a, a place you will not go when you um, are writing about people and experiences? Is there anything that's off limits? Well, I think writing fiction is that gives you so much more leeway to go to places that you would not normally go if you're writing nonfiction. So um, what I would say is that most of these, all of my characters have a piece of me in them, even the 
the the bad guy you know that's an aspect of me um so so definitely there is that but there's also a, an amalgam of experiences that my family friends and people who I interviewed um for the book have brought into you know that that have that have uh, kind of molded in, into what I wanted to write about in and then of course so much of it is autobiographical so so yeah it definitely taps into what I have experienced um so yeah it was it's much easier for fiction uh yeah I I love what um what Jan said about honor and respect because I think you know there is the fallacy that the I in poetry is autobiographical. And certainly that can be true, but the I in poetry is the persona of the poem, right? And and so there is room, I think, for that. But I, I will say this, right? This is my first um, book that is not an academic book, right? And an academic, right, discourse and sort of the way that the articles are written or books are written, right? It is very simple to sort of just go to the background and sort of not be an I, right? And so I, I, when this book finally came out, I thought, oh my God, it's going to be out there. Like, wait, I didn't actually process that part until it was there. And it's because, you know, um, this is my best way of having explored a narrative that was important to me, right? It, it, like my writing is to, to sort of put together, to sort of think through a, an experience. Um, and experiences, right, are lies all the time. Right. And they're also truth all the time. Right. There's something between there's something different between fact and truth. And and I think uh, I'm trying to think about a truth, but it's not the truth and it's not a, a tr it's just a truth, a possibility. Um, is there a line? I don't think I, I let anything when I'm writing. I don't think I let anything off the page. But then when I think about architecture of a text or thinking about kind of am I ready to release this I do think about it right um, like I have a couple of poems in the book about my nibbling and and my neat my goddaughter and I wrote those when they were younger and I realized that probably now I would need to ask them hey I have these these pieces that are loving and, and beautiful but is this okay right is this okay for for me uh, to, to talk about or to sort of think about. It's not that I wouldn't write it. I just might not publish it or I might not sort of share it. Um, there's actually a, a poem about my grandfather that I ended up pulling because I thought, you know what? I'm not ready for anybody to know. You know, I want to keep that story to myself, right, for, for now. Um, so something can be honorable and respectful and still be painful. Right, and I think probably that is a is a sort of a space that I think is where my writing ends up kind of being a lot of the time. Um, but I I do think of this book as a love letter too. Right, this is a book about what it means to love hard things, what it means to remember hard things, and and absorb and embrace them as part of who one is. Can I can I say something about that? Um, you know, yeah, I really relate to what you guys are saying. Um, but um, hard saying hard things, it's okay to say hard things. And yet, uh, not everyone would agree with that. And a, lo a lot of people don't want to hear anything difficult, or anything uh, true, if it makes them uncomfortable. And, you know, a lot of people want to want to read the happy stories and the happy books. And well, that's, that's up to them. But, you know, um, I, it, it reminded me of this quote by Adrian Rich, which I'm not going to get right, but it's something like, maybe you guys know, it's something like, there is no one truth, there is no a truth, there is only further complexity, which I, which I, I always like that. And, uh, but there's so much pressure, as we all know, not to go into difficult territory that may indict somebody, something, um, especially as women. You know, we're supposed to be nice and sweet. I mean, we're still supposed to be that way. I mean, <laughs> give me a break. How long has that been? Forever. And uh, it's still here. And that's too bad. Well, and then the other side of that, just to follow up, uh, Jan, because I think you're so right, is 
Then there's also a publishing expectation that if you are a certain kind of writer, like a, a writer of color, a black writer, then only your trauma is what's allowed, right, to be yeah. sort of published. Only your kind of like trauma for a white gaze or, or whatever. And so I think, right, the complexity of like, is that the only way in, right, to sort of the publishing world? And I think that's something I, I still have to think about. I don't know an answer. That's a really good, interesting point. Um, it, that conversation comes up a lot, I think, um, in my friends as they're writing and they're saying, is the publishing world progressing, um, both literary and even in the freelance world, if you only want my trauma and not my stories, right? I mean, the stories might have trauma in them, but it's my stories that you should be wanting. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, and they don't, they don't want the trauma without the healing. Everybody, <laughs> that <is> true. <laughs> like, yeah. we stay with the trauma for a minute, you know? Yeah, they, they want it wrapped up in a nice little package, right, at the end. All right, we have time, I think, for one more question. And Ari, I'm gonna start with you this time. Um, this is a two-parter, <clears throat> excuse me. Who did you write your book for? And this may or may not be the same person. If you could put this book in anybody's hands and they are going to read it, who would that be? <laughs> uh, well, I'm definitely with Soledad on this. This book is a love letter and it's the love letter, a love letter to my hometown of Shiraz. It's a love letter to those who have a uh, uh, share a vision of social justice beyond this unimaginative system that perpetuates rigid ideas of good and evil and reward and punishment, um, a social justice that aims to free both the oppressor and the oppressed. And of course, it's a, a love letter to refugees and immigrants, uh, all the displaced souls who yearn to become their own alchemists. And so I would um, put this, you know, I work with refugees and asylum seekers. I have a drum and dance circle that I um, facilitate weekly with, uh, with, with them. And uh, they, you know, they've, this is in Mex Tijuana, Mexico. These are the asylum seekers who are coming from uh, Central America. Um, and Haiti and Venezuela and other places to seek asylum, but they've been through so much. They've been through 3000 miles of travel. They've been assaulted along the way. And then they're told by the US Border Patrol that they have to wait indefinitely. And then many of them will be unfortunately deported to a place that they escaped, escaped from. So it's such a heartbreaking situation that their lives are so precarious. And, uh, and I, when we dance, we just for an hour to, we just dance to the songs that they love and they get to dance with their babies. Um, and we do that with Afghan refugees and Syrian refugees and, and, and so on here also. So the, this, uh, this, I would love for, for I, I want that to, and some of, some of the asylum seekers have them, have, have the book. Um, and I hope that more uh, get to um, have this and, and uh, just a, as a love letter to them, they, they get to keep, keep it and, and refer to it. Thank you. Janet, who did you write this book for and who would you like to place it into the hands of? You said me? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have, a, um, I have a dedication in my book that is, um, I wrote it for me, I wrote it for me. And then uh, at the beginning of the book, it says, this is for the lost ones who never knew where they came from. This is against the ones who pretended the loss never happened. And, um, you know, that's really it. It's for the people who never, who never got to know where they came from. Um, that, that's really it. Um, because even though there are, you know, open adoptions now, there's still a huge problem 
with the buying and selling of babies and the story that is told to them. And uh, so I'd like, you know, I'd like the cultural story to change or like at least put a big crack in it to um, acknowledge that um, it's, it's essential to know uh, where you came from and to not have that covered up and to not have uh, all this pretending about what this is and what this isn't. So, I mean, I wrote it for people, but I also wrote it for an idea of how I hope things can change. Um, yeah. Thank you. And solid on you. Um, I wrote this book for me, <laughs> I think. I mean, I, you know, I'm selfish that way. I, but I, I also think I wrote it for my mom and my sisters and, you know, we're, uh, my sisters and I are like what's called the 1.5 generation, right? We, we lived somewhere else for a certain amount of time and then we sort of were transplanted. And so we sort of have, you know, faded memories that sort of like do, that, that duality. I think I wrote it, I wrote it so that my mom, for my mother and for the other, for my niece, um, I think. So it's like for the past and for the future. Uh, in a way, because, um, and I think I wrote it to the, to writers that will, that maybe come from my, the places that I've been right in the future. So, so that there's a, so that there's a link, right. Even if it's just a link of imagination, right. A link of, 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 um, of promise. So I think I wrote it to a future, a future, someone like me, a future, someone like my niece, whose experience will be very different as an American from my own, who doesn't know Spanish, who has been to Santiago, but like under very different circumstances, right? Um, and yet that she that she kind of could see that that there was joy even in, in the stuff that, that hurt and that there's richness even in things that seem very simple. Thank, all, thank you all so much for being here with us today. Um, and thank you <clears throat> to everyone who is watching this. Uh, please click the link in the description. I'm sorry about my dog who decided at the very end to start growling and, and barking <laughs> in support. I'm gonna say it's in support, but I do <laughs> click the link <clears throat> in the description to purchase these books. Um, I've read them and they are amazing and you will not regret that. Um, so please do that. And I'm gonna ask each of you um, just one more time to hold up your book and um, and tell us who you are. And again, thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. Jan, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, this is American Bastard. It's me with a shotgun at six years old. My, my uh, personality formed early and <laughs> um, I, uh, I really want to thank Hannah and and Soledad and Ari. It's so great to talk to you guys. It's really been, I think we have so much in common. So I hope we meet in person soon. And this is a girl called Rumi. And it's, um, I should give a shout out to my wonderful publisher, Forest Avenue Press, um, who's just made the publishing journey a, a delight for me. And uh, thank you for to Jen, Hannah, and Soledad as well. I'm so happy that we got to have this little chat and I hope our paths cross soon. And I'm Soledad Caballero and this is my book, I Was a Bell, published with Red Hen Press. And this has just been a beautiful capstone to, to this wonderful week. And I'm just so grateful to Hannah and Jan and Ari uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you and have a wonderful day, everybody.